You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. As I've noted in the past couple of shows, we're really happy that our bookstore, which hosts this show, Wellington Square Bookshop, has uh, just won awards for the best bookstore in Philadelphia and the best coffee shop on the main line. So we're very proud of that. And with regard to this show, we were up to about 200 interviews, including the last three Pulitzer Prize winners and the last two National Book Award winners. And today we're lucky enough to have with us another great author, Paula Hawkins, whose first thriller is The Girl on the Train, which is the story of a woman who finds herself in the middle of a murder and the unfortunate position of that is not helped by the fact that she's an unreliable witness, an alcoholic, an unhappily divorced woman, and that she's very aware in many ways of the people involved who orbit this mystery. And for us as readers, we are doubly challenged by the fact that this is a mystery thriller narrated by that same unreliable witness, Rachel, who now becomes an unreliable narrator. Girl on the Train was published just last month, but it's already been acclaimed all around the world and translated into who knows how many languages and has been optioned by DreamWorks. Uh, Paula, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me on. So the first question, how many times have you heard the words gone girl in the same sentence in the past month? (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) Many, many times. Well, so let's get that out of the way. I mean, there's been so many comparisons in every interview, and I've listened to some of yours, mentions it. And And you do say how much you did like that book. I did. I loved it. And I, and, and I keep saying, um, I think Amy Dunn is a fantastic um, creation. It's a wonderful character. I mean, there are lots of char- good characters in that book, but Amy in particular. And I do, see the, I do see the point of comparison. There are many unreliable narrations. One of them, the way the, the, the uh, time, the, the narratives switch and the time scales are kind of out of sync. That, that is also um, quite similar in some ways. We have a, a complex, flawed female protagonist in both books. Um, but having said that, those the protagonists are very, very different. Um, my my Rachel, who you've you've spoken about a bit, the um, the girl on the train is is, as you said, an alcoholic. She is she has lost control of everything in her life. She's lost her job. She's uh, her marriage has broken down. She's she's really flailing. Um, so that she is that character is extremely different to Gillian Flynn's characters, um, and also we are seeing somebody who's whereas Gongol is about the breakdown of a marriage. This book is not about that. The marriage is already gone. Well, we're seeing something quite different here. Yeah, it's, uh, and in many ways, Rachel is so bereft of so many things that Gillian's character has, and it's much mm. it's much more difficult for I think for you to create a char- character who's not in control, as opposed to being a control freak, really. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that is correct. And she, she is really lost, and she's isolated herself completely, so she's become quite paranoid and obsessive, the way very, lone, very, very lonely people can sometimes become. Uh, so, yeah, she's, she is really all alone. Um, well, and because of that, and again, um, you know, I'm not doing it in order to compliment you. It's just that it's fascinating how you were able to do it. You have this person who's doesn't have a, have a lot of resources in so many different ways, yet she somehow unwittingly or in some strange way becomes the sleuth. And I know you're interested in Ag- Agatha Christie's work, and that's what started you on a lot yeah. of this. But she, how does she, how does this <laughs> not? I don't mean to say miserable creature, but how does this person who uh, has this void inside of her? How does she become, in your book, the sleuth of the story? Well, I think the thing is that um, she she has fixated on this woman this, who she she calls Jess and who later she finds out is actually called Megan, who goes missing. She's been fixating on her while she's been on her commute. The train goes past this woman's house, and she's become obsessed with her. She thinks she's the, a, the perfect half of a couple, and she's projecting all these feelings onto these people. And when, when Megan goes missing, she feels that she has she somehow has holds the key to this mystery. She she believes that she knows something that the police have missed. So she go, she gets drawn into it that way. But I think you've hit on a on a good point there that she's she is trying to fill a void. And so she sort of seizes on this thing as a way of it gives her a purpose. She's lost she's lost all her purpose. She, as I said, she's lost her job and her family. Now this this disappearance gives her sort of a reason to get up in the morning, a, a reason to stay sober in the morning, uh, a reason to try and, and, and 
you know, get through the day in a more kind in a more normal way. And it's funny as a reader, you know, when she kind of gets excited at times and she goes back and forth, which I actually sometimes do, she gets excited about helping the police or going yeah. to visit a certain individual that she or individual with an S that she shouldn't actually even be seeing. Yeah. When she does that and she puts herself in that position, she has created these resources for herself which for better or worse um you know move the novel along yes exactly exactly and go ahead so yes no 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 you, you can okay so so let's go back to the being the observer on the train because you know your life um at least to that extent um uh, you know, you draw from that portion of your life to begin the story. So, yes. talk about how you used to uh, ride the train, and I do well, too. Yes, I mean, I used to. I used to commute um, in into London for well, for I, at various points of my life, I've made various different commutes across the city. And um, some of the earlier ones, I I would ride a train that went very close to the backs of people's houses, and you could actually see into them. And at this point, it was quite when I just moved to London. I didn't really know anyone. I was quite lonely and. So and I felt a bit like a bit of an outsider, and I used to look into these houses and sort of imagine the lives of the people there, and I would almost feel a sense of connection. I, I sort of thought I knew what sort of people they were, and it, there's something quite comforting about that. You about forming that sense of that sense of connection. I think when you're in a big city and you're alone, um, and then much later I, I would sort of wondered wondered idly about what you know what what you would do if you saw something shocking. I never did. I never saw anything even remotely exciting. But um, I wondered about, you, you know, what sort of witness you would be and, and how you would react if you saw something, just glimpse something sinister or surprising on your commute. Yeah, it's fascinating what we do inside our own heads, which is essentially mm -hmm. the only tool we have. But we, yes. we, we spin these stories out. And I read this interesting study uh, yesterday about... Uh, people remembering things like when John F. Kennedy was assassinated or the Challenger explosion. And this yeah. w one university did a questionnaire where they asked you what you were doing. They did it the day after the explosion. And the people knew exactly uh, what had happened, where they had been, who they had been talking to. Yeah. And then they made them take the same questionnaire five years later. And they all, they all had a level of confidence of 4.6 out of 5. That they knew exactly what had happened. And when they filled it out this time, it was completely wrong really? yeah completely w different than what they had written the day after which which goes very much to what your book is about yes you know do you still do that do you still like even now do you still like when you're traveling do you look at people and wonder who they are what their lives are like yes i do i uh, i do i find so that, do I, I always find that fascinating when you can see i i often idly wonder i wonder though whether the um ubiquity of of uh, you know mobile phones that we can get connect to the internet with and that kind of thing and laptops and all that mobile whether that slightly is, will will kill that sort of impulse because you could, you're, everyone's just looking on their, on onto their phone rather than looking out the window but I I still I still like to date, look around and daydream so do I it's funny <laughs> not, not to keep popping up with the studies but I read another one that said that teenagers are unlearning the ability to discern what facial expressions mean. Really? Yeah, so if someone yeah. grimaces or looks angry, yeah. they're not quite sure because they haven't s seen faces. That's, that's really frightening, actually, isn't it? That's but, quite worrying. So out of Megan, Scott, Anna, Tom, and Rachel, who would you say you like or like best? Um, I think I'm... Probably Rachel. I feel closest to Rachel, even though she's a she's a mess. <laughs> but I feel that there's there is goodness in Rachel and her impulses. Although she makes some very bad judgments because of her addiction, her 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 instincts and her impulses come from a good place. Um, whereas, uh, to some degree, some of the the others tend to be a little bit more self interested. You know who I like best? Who? Evie. <laughs> All right. Yes. There's nothing. She's the only blameless one. <laughs> true. It is true. <laughs> and it's, that's another thing that's difficult to do and, uh, is to write a novel in which, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just, they, each, of the, each of the characters is flawed. They are very flawed. Um, and I think we are, but we are witnessing them at perhaps a very difficult point in a lot of their lives. They're, all of them are feeling to some extent a bit under threat or precarious. Well, Rachel's in her own particular situation, but Anna's there with this 
this w- woman who she sees as a crazy ex-wife stalking them. And Megan has some problems in her past that she's really struggling to deal with. And Scott thinks is not is not sure what his wife is up to. So they're all, everybody's feeling a bit pre- that their relationships are precarious or that they're in some way threatened. And so I think they are perhaps behaving in in slightly less likable ways than they would have done anyway. But yes, you're correct that they are. They're all deeply flawed. But I find flawed characters much more compelling to to write about and to read about. Yeah, I know it's funny because I, I listened to the one interview where you said when you were writing much lighter, more romantic stuff, or as actually you said, chick lit, um, you still had your darker side that wanted to come out. I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, yes, definitely. And um, when I was writing those books, the books just kept getting darker and darker. <laughs> so I, I eventually just thought perhaps I should be done with that and get get on with some crime writing. Well, the other good thing about the way you handled this and of crime writing is that if all of the characters are in precarious positions, either emotionally or um, for some other real world situation, it makes them all probable suspects. Yes. And um, and you got that from Agatha Christie too, I think. <laughs> well, yes, um, <laughs> but I mean, I I like that. I you you want that in a crime novel. You want to be able to to have a good range of people that could have done it, and you want to su- suspect everyone. And actually, I think the interesting, what I find interesting in in um, in thrillers is where actually everybody has everybody could have done it. Everyone. Not you know everyone has a credible reason for for being involved in the mystery. Did you know who did it at the beginning? I did, but I really? there were some twi- there were some twists that came along later, but um, the I, I knew that I had the bare bones of it. I didn't know where we I, w- I was going. I always wonder about that whether whether it just which ca- well so what came to you first the culprit or the crime? The cr- uh, the uh, the crime, yeah. Uh, sort of the situation. What came to me first was that that train journey, that moment of seeing something, and then sort of separately, I had the character of Rachel in my head. I'd been thinking about writing this this character, not necessarily in this story, but in some story, a woman or a person who drinks and is can't trust her memories as a result, and I wanted her to be involved in a in a crime in some way. You know, so the, the one thing is, uh, and the other thing is fascinating, and it's in your real life, is that this was published just last month, and now all this has happened. Did you ever expect in a million years that this is what was going to be happening in your life? No, no, absolutely not. Um, I was, we were, I was optimistic. My, uh, the publishers were were very pleased, and everyone was saying good things. We had a good response from bloggers and that sort of thing, but nobody, I, I did not expect to be. To this level of, um, of, of, you know, excitement and this level of sales quite so soon or um, po- probably ever. I mean, this has just been quite phenomenal. What do you think it is that um, makes readership now so intri- – well, you know, a lot of the authors I interview have written apocalyptic novels. Like, the apocalypse seems really popular now mm. because I think kids like the idea of, you know, I really don't like this world this much. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just wipe the whole thing yeah. and start with the I tabula think- rasa? <laughs> <laughs> and I think with what, what is it that makes readers like the idea of having someone who's totally unreliable? I think it, um, in some ways it draws the reader into the mystery more because if they can't trust the person who's telling the story, they're almost doing the sleuthing themselves. They've got to figure out what they can trust, what they can't trust, and that immediately draws you into a story. It makes you need to read between the lines and to second guess the the person who's talking to you know the person who's narrating to you and I always find that really um, interesting so there's that but I mean I d- I've, it's a difficult I mean it's, it's a difficult thing to put your finger on why people identify with one book and not with another I think also the the thing about the the voyeuristic impulse and the commute a lot of people identify with that perhaps they haven't all done what Rachel does they're not they don't take it to that extreme but everyone can kind of see that uh, you know people recognise that impulse and that that also draws them into the story. Well, I think it's you know, and in, in, in a simple fashion, it's just a lot of fun. It's yeah. fun, it's fun for the reader, mm. um, and also like the blurb, one of the blurbs on your book, where you know the idea is that you know, I, I couldn't put it down. You know, you I had to read it in one sitting, yeah. And then I can I could be angry at you because I started at nine. I have to take my kids to the school bus at five thirty <laughs> in the morning. You ruined an entire night's sleep for me. <laughs> I got. Like, I've heard that a couple of times. <laughs> yes, I've, lots of people hate me. <laughs> 
the one thing about an unreliable narrator is you can't write an unreliable, unreliable narrator. Then readers get upset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your unreliable narrator has to be reliable. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you about this. It's, it's, I'm so happy for your good fortune and, um, you know, your book. Oh, it's so funny. Um, I was at my bookstore today and um, someone comes up and goes, what's this book, you know, a girl on a train about? I said, I'm interviewing her in two hours and it'll be broadcast next week. So in the next half hour, we sold 10 copies of your book. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was Fantastic. so funny. I know. Oh, we well, did... thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, too. Uh, okay. It works both ways. That was Paula Hawkins, and I really enjoyed uh, the end there because it just happened to be true. I mean, I was just about ready to get into my car, and these four people came into the bookstore. It was already pretty crowded, and they came in because they saw us on Yelp, and then they couldn't find it, which is hard to find us the first time. And so they used their GPS to guide them in, and the first thing they said when they walked in is we heard about this book called Girl on a Train. And um, it's been out of stock everywhere because it's gotten so popular so quickly. You know, it was released January 13th. It's not even a month, three weeks. And so we just got a whole bunch of them in today. In the next hour, we sold them all. And I think, um, I know she must be sick of the comparisons to Gone Girl, but she handled it very diplomatically. But this book is different because in Gone Girl, you have a protagonist who's completely within herself, completely in control, hyper control. And here you have this woman, Rachel, who has no control at all over her life Yet somehow, not like Columbo, but somehow in this strange fashion, she's able to cobble together um, this random walk through life and through the situations of these people until she, well, I won't give anything else away, but she becomes intimately involved in the solution of this mystery thriller. So um, it's fun doing these kinds of books because... Normally, I'm not a mystery uh, reader. You know, if I had, I would stick to, you know, if I could, I could stick to science fiction and science writing. I love that. But it's been such a pleasure being able to interview this wide, wide range of authors in various, various topics, history and historical fiction and um, uh, magical fiction and science and nonfiction and uh, memoirs like last week. Uh, um, so that's what's great about these. These are books I might not read, but I'm so glad that I have. And like I said, we're coming up on 200 of them. So continue to join us if you have been. If not, tell somebody. Um, every week we have someone new. Uh, we are now in a position that the publicists are actually coming after us, which is great. and makes me feel so proud. Um, upcoming guests include uh, Alexandra Fuller, Rebecca Sherm, Catherine uh, Haney, and Emma Walsh. And um, uh, each of those books are masterpieces in their own right. And we try to get the ones that we think are going to be at the top. And, and with that, and me going on and on as I usually do, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to you listening to another one of our broadcasts next week. Thanks very much. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today. 